All right, welcome everyone. This is the first of a series of interviews where we take some time and interview a couple of the most knowledgeable and experienced industry experts. I, I know, just take, roll with me on this, David, um, <laughs> and get your opinions on the past year and, and what 2024 <laughs> might hold and really put the shoe on the other foot um, and, and can ask them some questions. My name's Sean Luchens. I'm the GM of Total Rewards at Vizier. And um, I'm new to this, if you can't tell, but I'm really excited to talk to some of these industry experts. And to kick this off, we have one of the best. Uh, we're lucky enough to have David Tereski from HR Data Labs podcast. Welcome. Do you like that intro? Uh, it's actually really good. You did a great job, Sean. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, so can you give us... Um, can you give us a little history of your background, you know, kind of run through your background, because I think it's one of the most interesting backgrounds. And I say that being serious because it covers kind of, as people will see, a, a wide range. Thank you. So I went to college to be an architect and then seven weeks into the program failed. And so I carried six credits of F throughout my entire college career. <laughs> and what happened was I stumbled into economics and uh, my first economics course, uh, the teacher came up to me afterwards and he said, Oh, so you're an economics major. And I said, no, I have no major. And he said, well, you're an economics major. And because I just loved the trying to understand how people act and react to stimuli, whether it's economic stimuli from getting a paycheck or whether it was just listening to the environment around them. And so I used that background. And my first job was at uh, Towers Perrin Foster and Crosby, the, the old TPFNC. And my first job was modeling compensation programs um, using... Uh, well, we we were using mean frame focus yes. to regress how people got paid based on their skills, knowledge, and abilities. And so that kind of led into a, this love affair of compensation and human resources and being able to help managers see HR as a business decision, not as a HR decision, right? And making compensation decisions that were best for the company and the employee. And so I wound my way through being practitioner, being a consultant, and uh, my last job um, was having Tretsky Consulting before I came to salary.com, where now I'm the CHRO and VP of Consulting. That's new news, Sean. That happened yesterday. Huh? So um, so now I'm doing fractional CHRO, plus I'm doing my day job of helping companies solve their big problems by um, consulting with them. It's kind of cool. You get to talk the talk and then and then kind of have to go walk the walk, right? Yeah, so, um, exactly. I have to take know. my own medicine. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to tell everyone you guys should all do this, but, uh, but I'm not going to in my day yes, job. Exactly. And along the way, I get to podcast with brilliant people like Sean, um, and be able to help uncover how some of the most brilliant minds inside and outside the world of HR are actually dealing with this crazy complex world that we live in today. And I've been doing that since 2020 and that's just so much fun. It is interesting before we get to some other questions. I, I, joke and tell people all the time I've been around a while but I've never been a practitioner and that's because that looks hard I love helping them solve problems but that that looks ridiculously yeah. hard being a practitioner and, and taking all this theory and putting it into practice and I think I've heard you say it on your podcast before too and I'm, I try to use the same thing it's it's hard to predict everything because HR's it, it's got humans involved which exactly. are yeah. unpredictable and everything's personal even you can't yeah. unpersonalize something that personal no it, it it's actually you're actually very true i mean it's it's so hard you can say all you want about best practices we, we hate that word right best practices mm -hmm. but when you actually put them into practice and you yes. see what it actually does to people's lives you then kind of step back and you go oh wow i've been con i've been saying this or i've been consulting that yep. and so having been a practitioner yeah it's it's actually gives you a really good it's not, it's like a cold glass of water in the face sometimes of the, yeah, you may not want to consult about that next time because you saw how it happened. So yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a wake up call. So before we get going, um, so a little bit of what you do usually ask something different about folks, but I'm, I actually ask this of everybody during interviews. And even when I have intro calls at where I work or whatever, but what, what do you do for fun outside of work as a, as a normal human? What is there an outside of work? Oh, no. Uh -huh. um, so um, I've been writing books, um, the HR Data Doodles book. Um, I'm in series two right now. Series three is in production and series four got written. So writing books, um, basically very thought leadership based, 
about all the things we talk about and all these issues, these complex issues, and just making them fun and making them la- making people laugh, reading a page, flipping to the next page and going, you know, which character is going to make me laugh this time? Um, and then also I coach my son's hockey team. It's a peewee hockey team under 12, uh, 12 and under. And um, that's four times on the ice um, a week. Plus I skate guard on weekends. So I help people learn how to skate and I keep them, try and keep them safe. Okay. That's awesome. Um, it's funny. I, I like to do a lot of stuff. I might possibly be the world's worst ice skater. I'm <laughs> That's <awful>. not true. <laughs> my, my brain, like uh, I told people, I had to stop figure skating when we moved, figure skating, ice skating, yep. when we moved to Vermont, um, when the kids got good enough to get off the crate because that meant I had to get off the crate. Yeah. Um, so that that was the end of my my career. So the fact that you're out skate your and spending that much time. Hey, you know what? The people say all the time that they don't know how to skate and then someone kind of triggers something in their brain they tell them something like bend your knees you know learn how to balance you know don't do this and then all of a sudden it just comes to them and it's kind of like you know it's kind of like riding a bike there's someone who can connect the dots for you and be able to to help you see oh if i did this one thing differently i'll feel more comfortable and the problem with skating is when you have doubt when you're discomfort in on those skates you're gonna fall when you balance and you feel like you're in balance and you don't think about it anymore that's when you don't fall unless somebody it's kind of like an analogy for life i think you know yes it is true very deep so how'd you get into the podcasting piece with all the career that was there and everything else Uh, how'd you how'd you get started into that space Uh, that's a great question so when i was um in turetsky consulting and we were blogging we're doing a lot of linkedin you know publishing we found that nobody was listening Nobody was watching, nobody cared. And so what we tried to do is we tried to meet people where they wanted to be, which is some like the medium of, of reading, some like the medium of listening and podcasting was growing tremendously during the the pandemic. And so we, you know, said, Hmm, let's try this. And one of the fascinating things about podcasting is that if you're successful, that means you've gotten past like 10 episodes or 10, 20 episodes. Well, no one told us that. And so he just kept going and going and going. So we started October 1st, 2020. And then along the way, we gathered an audience and things started to happen and people started listening, people started reacting. And now we've achieved 150 episodes and we there's a, there's a uh, website called, I think, Listen Notes. And if you look at Listen Notes, it tells you what your rank is amongst 3 million podcasts. Um, and we're in the top 10th percentile. I mean, we're not talking Joe Rogan numbers here, but we're, we're, you know, we were like shocked. Holy crap. We're 10th percentile. That's pretty amazing. And one of the things is longevity, you know, being able to be, you know, podcasting for three years is kind of amazing. Yep. But along the way, we've had lots of really wonderful conversations and what keeps us going is the listeners as well as People now saying, hey, I want to be on your podcast, which is kind of cool. That makes it easier. So as we spin that around, um, you know, kind of if you aggregate all the, you you know, your thoughts, obviously, and then those of the guests that you've had over the past year, kind of thinking over the past year, what's the most important thing? And I'm going to take AI off the table a little bit because I I had to say AI because it wouldn't be a anything in 2023 without the words AI. Yeah, right. But what's the most important thing that you've seen in the space the past year? You know, change or tech or, you know, really open-ended? Uh, I got to be honest with you. The thing that kind of shocked me the most is our use of language um, in, in interactions. I know that might come out of left field, but so, being more inclusive in our language and being more thoughtful in how we talk, um, a lot of times we use phrases and words that we don't think about that they're just part of our vernacular. And one of the guests I had on, um, show you her book, um, Jackie Ferguson kind of reminded us, reminded me in her book, the inclusive language handbook, that the things that we say hurt people and the things are, you know, meaningless, you know, in our minds, but they're meaningful to other people. And I think that was the thing that kind of woke me up during our latest season and, um, it was really useful. It was really important to hear 
because I'm a lifelong learner. I love learning that I've been making mistakes this whole time. So that, to me, that was, that was the biggest one. The second one is, um, learning from people who've been on journeys, um, for a very, very long time around who they are and how they present themselves to the world. And so being your authentic self. And I had a couple of people on, um, who really opened my eyes to the fact that when you're LGBTQ plus and you're in the workforce, a lot of times you have to not be able to communicate who you are and what you are. And that's really, it's really hurtful. It's really disappointing. I have two kids who are LGBTQ and I don't want them growing up in a world where they have to hide who they are and, you know, what they are from, from, from the world. And so I think it's really good that we're starting to have conversations around people being their authentic, their authentic selves at work and feeling supported by that and not having to hide. Obviously, we're in political landscape right now where that's a little challenging. And that's where awareness and compassion come into it. And so as a white male, I'm trying to be better through every interaction that I have. I'm trying to be meaningful and trying to be an ally as much as I possibly can. It's really interesting. It, my, um, uh, I have a, a brother who is gay and lives in London. Um, the reason he lives in London is he, at the time uh, he met his partner, um, was in the U.S. working for uh, one a large accounting firm, um, who actually was pretty helpful. But um, he had to be careful who he was, it, right. particularly in the U.S. And then, of course, they moved to the U.K. because they couldn't get married here at the time. Yep. And so, you know, when when people always say, "Well, does it really affect you?" I'm like, you'd be surprised actually who it affects and the realm and the, and the world that it affects, you'd be surprised um, how many people affects. And, you know, for me, it was like, okay, now my brother has to move to London. Um, I'm a lifelong Arsenal fan. So actually, you know, <laughs> it worked out okay for me. Um, and, but, you know, then they set up roots and they live there and, yep. and, you know, he, you know, I think at some level he stays there because they were the country that accepted him yep. and the community that accepted him um, over, over this particular place. But it was interesting for me to watch him have to navigate that. Yeah. Um, because he, you know, had to be professional at the accounting firm and that was not okay. I won't say how old I am, but he's not that much younger than me. So it was, yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, it was not okay. And so we had to navigate that and, you know, you figure yeah. it like, works hard enough to be successful, exactly. to do the right things, to make your clients happy, to get everyone going, to get the team going. Like the last thing exactly. you want to do is have to think about that. Like I, I, I wouldn't have been able to and the world of work continues to change and continues to grow. And hopefully we won't see retrenching and we won't go backwards when it comes to acceptance in the workplace. Heck, I, we just released a podcast on workplace violence yesterday that I, I hated to have to release. But a lot of that comes from misunderstandings, miscommunications, um, and people being treated unfairly or poorly or have that perception. So, um, I hope we grow as a society and grow as a, as a country and as a world <laughs> so that people don't have to worry about being authentic self. So I think the, the youngest generation that's out there right now, the ones coming out of school and I, uh, you know, it's actually again my age, the, the, my, my kids generation, you know, coming right. out of school, they seem to have less tolerance and more you know, open. And I'm hoping and hoping that that drives corporate culture a little bit, because if you want the best performers and that's where their exactly. mindset's at, I'm, you know, I'm very hopeful that that's the case because, you know, as we spin this back to, you know, the HR tech side and the HR, it's like, what are your high performers doing and what's important to them and their values? Because that's the piece that's going to keep them there and performing sure. high. And if you're flying in the face of that, they will go to somewhere else that values that. Um, and how do you, you know, how do you measure that? That's different, right? Because that's not like how many widgets can I make in an hour thing? The culture is hard. Um, and yeah. a lot of companies talk about culture, but then don't deliver on it. So Absolutely. it's going to be hard for them to navigate too. That's, that's a right. really interesting one because I think that softer stuff, as we mentioned, joked a little bit early about human resources. Um, hey, this is William Tincup, Work to Fun. Hey, listen, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Inside the C-Suite, the podcast. It's a look into the journey of how one goes from high school, college, whatever, all the way to the C-suite, all the ups and downs, failures, successes, all that stuff. 
Give it a listen. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast. You know, it involves humans uh, by it default, does. and it, it, it does make it trickier. It's not 100% it statistical. Yep. So with that in mind, if you looked at that in the last year, what do you see, you know, over the next, you know, kind of putting in the uh, crystal ball, looking ahead for the next 12, 24 months, what do you think is coming or is it more of the same? I think there's going to be a tremendous push to try and rationalize the work at home hybrid work um, thing. Um, return to work has been handled very poorly by some organizations and been handled very well by others. In many instances, remote work has kind of become the default from an employee perspective, or at least an expectation for many. And so I think there's going to start to be more regulation, more um, thought process around it. And that's going to creep into a lot of how we run our HR organizations. I also see us, um, I know that technology works like this, asking people to be on camera much more than, you know, people say, oh, well, I don't want to be on camera today. Okay, well, that's a choice. But more often than not, you're going to start seeing organizations that do accept remote work to have people be on camera. I think that also is going to change how people meet. Maybe there's going to be less meetings. Maybe there's going to be more get stuff done time than meet time because people are multitasking too much in during meetings today anyways. So hopefully the rationalization comes to, um, well, we need to be smarter about the time we put into what is a meeting, what are we trying to achieve by it? The second thing I think that's going to come is around pay transparency and pay equity, where we're going to start to see more states in the United States take on more legislation that requires at least the posting of starting pay ranges for jobs because that's actually turned out to be a really good thing and companies are now realizing it's a good thing and they're being more proactive about it instead of waiting for legislation to push them to do it and if you're in a state that doesn't have it but you're surrounded by states that do what? that company has to probably do it anyways because most of the people they're recruiting for or paying or, or working for or looking for are in those states. So I, I think transparency is not, it's not, it's not certainly not, it's not dead, but it's also going to take on a new life in 2024. It's interesting on the work from home. So I don't know how public, you know, public, I, uh, I don't, I wasn't the first, but I've been working remote for 19 years. Wow. Um, so, so it's right, we, out of, right out of high school then. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I wish. So it's interesting to have watched kind of the cycle of life from, you know, you're the, you know, you're the weird one and how do you make it work and how difficult right. it was to work from home. And actually at, at one role, you know, we're going to give you a go, but we don't think this is going to work. Right. Um, to everyone's working at home and people are like, how do you do this? Um, right. um, to now this kind of where I think it's actually harder, this hybrid thing it's interesting you mentioned the camera i'm a big advocate of camera i i'm always yep. on camera um i i think it's i actually think it's a little disrespectful to not be on camera without a good reason um yeah. you know you wouldn't you wouldn't put a bag over your head or turn and face the other direction in a face-to-face meeting uh in general i've done that before i've been told to do that before so well that's for different reasons probably <laughs> <laughs> well, my mom always said i had a face for a radio so there you go no we should it shouldn't have you on the video podcast then She's going to be really upset with me. True. That's true. Um, so I think I think that is really yep. interesting as companies struggle. The the one coming out, my personal opinion on that is I think companies have to realize, again, it's human resources. Right. And um, I'm notoriously, believe it or not, introverted. I like my space. I work very well with yep. that, being able to carve the time out. Um, I like, inter, you know, I'm not what they people think an introvert sometimes is. But there are people who like the office. So that, you know, and they want to go talk to yeah. everybody and go hang out. And so how do you build a culture where you can get the best people possible on board and kind of work with them all? And I think the flexibility that some companies offer where there's a place to go, yeah. there's times when you need to be there and that, you know, that, that ability to be flexible or to at least have some flexibility will provide people with, I think, at least enough of both. The yeah. ability to go in and to be with people and to, you know, share things together 
and then the ability to be home and take care of yourself, your family, the needs that you have, and also the expense of, of commuting and the yeah. wear and tear on your body of commuting. I think those two things are not, they're not opposed. I think they're, they're, they're possible. And so as we grow into what does hybrid look like? What does remote become? I think a lot of times you're going to see companies like Bluconic. Um, we had their CHRO on our podcast. We talked about how they've gone to, they've, they've eliminated their corporate headquarters and they've gone completely remote. Well, that's one way of doing it. What did they also do? They also hired and rented and leased space to be able to have people come and be together. It doesn't need to have the blue conic name on the on the mantle, but they can be together and they can they can do things that they want to do in common at a place if they need to. And I think that's going to become more popular because the, you know the world has changed. I mean, infectious oh. disease hasn't stopped. You know, the pandemic is not really over. I, I can tell because. Four out of the uh, three out of the four coaches on my son's hockey team have some kind of respiratory illness, sure. and I'm the one who doesn't, and I'm feeling like crap right now. So um, that small sample size kind of leads me to believe we're not out of the woods yet. Um, and you know, remote does help that a lot. Yeah, I, mean, I think that flexibility is is going to be key, and and yeah, I think that's awesome. I think that's a great great thing that people are dealing with and how do you do the real estate footprint's a real thing, right? Being an right. office manager is kind of, that's gotten more complicated because the, your office is now yeah. not one or two locations. It's 50 people somewhere that have to meet and maybe do events, et cetera. Exactly. Um, exactly. On, so the, on the um, pay transparency side, I mean, how do you see companies getting in front of that best? And I guess the follow-up question to that, as you mentioned, the the posting of jobs from a pay transparency that's the external pay transparency do you see the internal pay transparency you know how how far behind do you see that well so i think them uh, let me take the the latter first before <laughs> i deal with the former so i think that companies need to come up with a pay transparency strategy of communication internally that enables people not just managers but employees to understand we're going to be posting jobs and we're going to be posting them with ranges. And so if your pay range looks like it's more than you're getting, here's why, and here's how we talk about it, and here's what it means to you, and here's what we're going to do about it. Um, that's an important part of being able to have a transparent organization is being able to deal with areas and scenarios where pay's not secret anymore. <laughs> I need to now deal with issues of compression, I need to deal with the market movements and how that affects my current staff. That's all part of transparency. You can't hide stuff anymore. That's what transparency means. <laughs> so I think there's a communication strategy and there's a there's now going to be a new push to actually have development of a consistent set of processes. And this gets to the, the former point you made. Um, we're going to have to actually do a lot more market analysis. We're going to have to take data and get more modern sources of data and surveys will evolve and other technologies will be there to enable us to get what's going on in the marketplace today so that companies can create better ranges, more modern ranges, and not wait three or four years to update their ranges because the market will move. People will see it. It'll be very public. And, the, and when I say people, I mean your candidates will see it, your employees will see it, and your managers will see it. And so I think there's going to be almost a kind of a coming out party for compensation plans and compensation policies and compensation programs. So much so that compensation will not be secret anymore. We're going to be sharing things that we never did. We're going to be talking not just about structures, we're going to be talking about plans and policies. And that means that companies need to modernize their compensation systems in order for them to see the light of day. Because you and I both know we've been in this a long time. We use a lot of compensation speak in our plans and policies. We talk about midpoint progressions. We talk about uh, range penetration. We talk about things that people go, what the hell does that mean? What's compa ratio? I don't, I don't know what a compa ratio is. Some people say compa ratio. Some people say comp A ratio. They have no idea because what we've developed inside of compensation has been this language of our own, this vernacular, and it doesn't mean anything to the external world. So it's not like building a handbook around comp. Sure. And that's not going to work because we're dealing with external parties and we're dealing with internal parties and we really have to, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, 
we're dealing with lowest common denominator here, which is there are managers and employees who don't know compensation speak. We have to be very simple about, you know, what do these things mean? And so if we have uh, zones or if we, you know, comp ratio zones, we now need to call them something else, right? And we need to be very honest and open with how and why we've built these things in the past. So I, I know that's a long-winded answer to say, you know, we need to be more open about the world of pay. And that's going to cause us a lot of work. I think it's really interesting you say that because the other piece that I always tie to that is if if you're going to force or require need managers and et cetera to be more up to speed on everything and how are they going to handle this in a programmatic way, a defensible way. Um, you've got pay equity, you've got all that in there. Um, a third of them statistically, you know, uh, jokingly, not 75% of statistics are made up on the fly, but um, <laughs> from, this, from some recent studies, point. about a third of managers are doing it for the first or second time. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, even if they've done it several times, they're doing it once, twice at best a year. Exactly. And so the expectation that compensation people assume I can send them a PowerPoint with a lot of jargon and methodology and stuff, and they're going to retain that. One, first, are they going to care? Two, are they going to retain it? No. So I think the tech space from the standpoint of how can we help them? And actually, it's a great point, David, in, in normal English speak, uh, translating from comp to normal human, how can we help them provide them tools? And then I think the secondary effect, and I'd be curious on your opinion, will be not secondary systems, but like pay for performance, you know, the yeah. performance systems, because how, if you've got a transparent system, you know, you have to somehow show and document and prove that, you know, David's making more in the range because right. he's a better performer and Sean's making lower in the range because we're still not sure why we hired him. Yeah. Um, that has to be documented in a performance way. Otherwise you're leaving latitude for people to say, well, I'm not paid the same and why. Right. I think there's some philosophical, really cool upsides like that can come out of this for manager discussions because obviously if you're getting paid less, it opens the door to some cool discussions. Half of the managers will say, well, good. Half of them will be like, oh, crap. I don't exactly. want to have <laughs> but, but I think there's another downfall of, or, or maybe it's a downside. Maybe it's an upside, which is that our data, which has typically been crap in HR, has got to get cleaner. We've got to know more about the people that we're paying. We've got to know more about their background. We have to really understand their experience levels because if we are, to your point, generating a gap in pay, we need to justify that how and why. Um, and it's not just things that are documented, it's observable. You know, what are the skills this person has? Why are we giving them the extra? And this other person doesn't have this skill. Okay, so that's what the, the gap came from. So we've been trying to get to skill-based pay for years to try and generate, you know, if I take a person and they're a set of these skills, does that equate to what we're paying them? Well, we may not be able to get to that, but at least, you know, when we have skill acquisition and then be able to give that person an increase based on the skill acquisition, document it very clearly and put it in the database, then we may be in a more defensible position about pay and how we pay and how we differentiate. But Right now, the data, I think, is our biggest downfall when it comes to all that. Yeah, and I think the the reality of being able to aggregate and put that data into some type of analytical format, right, from multiple yep. systems yep. is, is going to be hard because you start thinking about, I've kind of said it all the time, you know, HR has the most disparate systems typically, yep. and you have to, to really do it right, I think, pull in business items, right? So you can figure yep. out, you know, how much impact this person has to the business versus the other, et cetera. It's a lot to do, like you said. So I think, and then and then turn it into human language. Exactly. Those are great points. Um, so with that in mind, with all that stuff going on, the question I thought would be kind of interesting is if you could solve one HR issue, um, you know, with a magic wand or what have, and, you know, <laughs> what would that be? If I had to solve one HR issue, it would be the pay gap. It's just not not fair. It's not necessary. There's no reason, there's no valid reason why we should pay people differently based on who and what they are. It, it's just, it's just horse shit. Pardon my French. Yep. Now you have an E for, for me saying that, <laughs> uh, or you can bleep me out. But no, but seriously, I'm very, it frustrates me. It gets me very upset yep. that we pay people differently. We get, we think we get bargains because we pay people less for who they are and, and people celebrate that. And it's awful. 
um, the pay gap should not exist. There should not be a reason why people doing the exact same job are paid differently because of who they are. And so if I were able to wave my magic wand, it would be to get rid of that right yeah, now. That, that's awesome. I, I've, I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm always baffled by it. And I hold out this little bit of silver lining of hope that as the world becomes more inclusive and more people um, get over that, that basically um, one person's bias becomes another person's victory because someone will be like, here's what we pay for this work. I don't know what they were doing. I value you at this amount. And, th I, and then it kind of starts to self-normalize and that companies, whether they want to be good payers or not, um, kind of get forced into being good payers. I, I do believe back to your point of systems and, and other stuff and how you push that down and how you do English. I do think well over 90%, I hope it's 99%, of companies want to be good payers um, in general. Like I know you, we, we can debate a little bit. I yeah. think how do they get there and how do you do that? And I think the one fundamental problem is for companies, there's only one way to fix it. Everyone's talked about how do you fix it? Well, you, you pay the people that are underpaid more. You don't take someone and move them back. We know that's human nature, right? They'll, they'll what have right. you. So it's a money issue that's fundamentally out there. That's a, a truth. And so I hope it, I, I'm with you. I, I'm baffled by it when we talk about it. Why is this an issue? And I'm still sometimes yep. wake up and, and look at pay equity and talk about pay equity and be like, I, I fundamentally struggle that we have this problem, but it's it's a thing to worry about. You know, a long time ago, um, as a compensation practitioner, I once talked to my head of HR and CFO to talk about gaps. And we talked about making a market adjustment budget that was rich enough to be able to solve some of that. And what I got back was it's a zero sum game. If we take money out of, if we put money into market adjustments, we have to take it out of somewhere else. And I said, Hmm, we're very profitable. I don't understand why that's necessarily a truth. Well, well, you know, if we weren't profitable, you know, this would just make our numbers even worse and blah, blah. And I said, you just made an excuse why you want richer bonuses so that people couldn't get paid more fairly. And I don't like that now as a leader. I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that doesn't happen. And it, it's, you know, maybe it's one of those things where you learn a lesson and now you're, now you're in a place where you can do something about it. And hopefully I can. I think the tools are better that, and, and the process has generally been, you know, David, you're now with the CHRO, you need to roll out a 4% increase. We did, that's what we've decided, right? Can we start the other way and have the tools and infrastructure and start the process that says, for me to get everyone to midpoint or to get everyone here and cover pay equity, here's the money and here's the layers. In the past, I, I do firmly believe there was a, a, such a large lift for human resources to go back, comp people, really? um, to go back and model out seven, eight, nine different models of if I do an even spread of pay, if I create by differentiation and do my, like, that was a lot of work, right? Yeah. And by the way, they have other stuff to do. Sure. Will tools allow them to go back and, and present that? I might be crushed later when people come back with those analytics and say, well, I, I presented them the way you thought we should present them and people do things and they didn't do it anyway. But I do think that's part of it. An, an entire podcast can be um, talked. We, we talked through that on an entire podcast of how do you model pay where you look at the market and you see where people are and you try and get them there, you know, basically on an equal footing, you know, when a job is getting paid this, and you know, people who are all over the board, you know, how do you get people to that number? And so I, I think you're right. I think technology could help that today. But, you know, even when we were doing this back in the late nineties, well in the nineties or the early thousands, I, I think we had technology. I think Excel helped us get there. Of course there were compensation tools, but, um, I, I think it was more the will at that point, not the way. And so I think now, because of the emphasis on pay equity, the emphasis on transparency, I think we're going to kind of be forced to get more closely to that. And as starting rates, because they're being published, as starting rates are published, I think we're starting in the right place. So I think it's more achievable today than it ever was. You're right. Some of it might be systems, but I think more of it's cultural than, than <laughs> systems. And so the last thing is, is uh, to wrap up, do you have any kind of final thoughts for HR or compensation people as we head into 24? AI. 
I knew you're <laughs> you're gonna get me at some point. I knew I knew since I took it off the table, you come you come back. That's great. No, let me let me let me qualify that. AI is in every discussion because it's a transformative technology, just in the same way that the internet was in the '90s and early 2000s. And so, I think that we're going to get much smarter about the world of artificial intelligence and how it impacts how people work, yeah. not replacing people, but enhancing how we work. I, I think the in, you're replacing people is just, I think that's just banter and bull crap. I, I think that's, you know, one of those things where they're trying to scare you. And so, you know, let's not use a car because it's going to replace the horse. What are we going to do with all those horses? Um, I think it's going to be something where we're going to see some productivity gains. We're going to see some failures, but we're going to see some productivity gains from it. And I think it's going to reach into the HR world in a very good way and enable us to get to more strategic stuff, just in the same way we thought analytics was when people analytics first came out. But I think there's more to see there. And the second thing I'll, I'll say for 2024 is, is that because it's going to be a political cycle, I think we're going to see a lot more, um, questions about what does the world of HR look like, whether it becomes a Republican administration or a Democrat, you know, say it's Democratic yeah. administration. I think that's going to be huge in the U.S. Um, and so the political cycle is going to really heat up in the summertime, especially. And that's going to change a lot of things. Do you think that's going to, you know, cause kind of a, a slowdown and people evaluating and making changes to yeah. their transparency? You know, policy Probably. and tech changes. Well, I don't know about transparency. I think transparency is here to stay, anyways, because that's a state <laughs> issue. That's not really a federal issue. I think that the world of work is going to slow down significantly because some of the things that might happen on a federal level that could change that. Sure. You know, things like FLSA and and you know, overtime and 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 things that or minimum wage and other things that are kind of more global in nature that have federal um, uh, touch. I think that's what's going to be bigger. So yeah, I do see a slowdown happening, but you know, it's also going to be that everybody holding their breath to see what happens in November. Well, I really appreciate it, David. I really appreciate the time. It's great to get your insight. Always great to chat with you. So I, I appreciate you. it. Um, you know, thanks again. And um, we'll chat with everyone else later. Take care. Thank you.